Appsera is a sponsor of our ebook series on Docker and the container ecosystem. Learn more about Appsera's perspectives on these timely and important topics in our latest ebook about application architectures and microservices. It's available for download at thenewstack.io. Okay, hey, Alex Williams, the new stack here, the post Docker con here on the, on the Hilton, I guess, rooftop or deck uh, yeah, area. Yeah, some balcony. Yeah. Josh, why don't you tell us who you are and, and we'll get started with the interview. Sounds great. So my name's Josh Ellathorpe. I'm a software architect at Appsera, working on our enterprise grade container platform. And I've been there for about two years and had an amazing time there so far. Uh, so you're a software architect at Appsera. What is Epsera's view right now of the Docker and container ecosystem? So right now the container ecosystem obviously is extremely hot. I think that people uh, are looking at Docker as a nice way to be able to move applications from one host to another and stay away from some of the virtualization technology in the long term. Uh, I think that most of that is powered by the actual container tech in Linux itself, which is giving traction to companies like CoreOS and our own container format at Appsera, and leading to new initiatives to standardize containers to make sure that multiple vendors can have compatible implementations, uh, the goal of uh, the OCI spec. What is the format that you've developed? So basically, uh, AR software is written in Go, but we all leverage similar technology, C groups and namespaces. Um, a lot of the container technology is using AUFS as the file system or overlay FS. Uh, leveraging things like sec comp, user namespaces, and um, trying to maintain compatibility with App Armor, SE Linux, and other security tools. So that's the format side of it. Now, with the standards, the standardization of it, what is the what's the corollary there with with the format itself? So th the way I look at it is, a lot of people want to play in this space. And while Docker is extremely popular, they want to make sure that the spec is open enough that people can write their own implementations and still retain complete compatibility in the ecosystem. So whether or not you use Docker's actual tooling like Docker D or Docker Engine, people still want to be able to write their own tooling around a, a standardized image format. So how do you help them do that? So basically the OCI is just to make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to how containers are described and how they're implemented uh, inside of uh, many different systems. So at Appsera we wanted to play a part of that because we've been working with containers for about four years now uh, before Docker existed, before there was a core OS and we want to make sure that we have the most compatible runtime. and then players like Red Hat and other people on the OCI initiative are writing their own PaaS type systems and other container systems and they want the flexibility of writing their own tooling around those image formats so that they can produce you know, new innovation in the space. So let's get a, a level set on Appsera and what it does. Okay, so basically Appsera is a, uh, a platform for enterprises to deploy containers with a lot of additional security and policy enhancements included. We kind of look at it as a complete workflow, all the way from you having source code on your machine to detecting the frameworks that you have, being able to stage those without having to write the equivalent of a Docker file, have that all be automated in the packaging phase, have a policy grammar that understands all the different actions in the system so that we can have granular controls over things like network policy, service bindings, uh, scheduling, resource allocation, etc., so that an organization has all the tools they need for multi-tenant environments and to really understand uh, the security footprint of their cluster. All the way through scaling out their application uh, across multiple hybrid cloud environments. So we find that a lot of customers are looking to scale out to AWS or scale out to a public cloud, but they already have private cloud infrastructure. So how do you leverage it to make sure that your workloads are portable, that you have a single policy and security system that understands all these different cloud environments and allows you to control extremely complex topologies? So you need to be able to have those standard underpinnings to do that. And you can't do that with Docker and container the Docker alone? So you can do some of these pieces with Docker today. They've taken a lot of great strides in security. The 1.9 release released uh, user namespaces. They have new security initiatives like Nautilus. Um, and they're doing some really great work there. But the reality is, is that their current author authentication and authorization system is really around the Docker registry itself. So they understand the 
um, the security hooks and auth authorization hooks around should I be able to get this image? Should I be able to retrieve it? Um, and But then it kind of gets lost when you talk about the relationships between multiple containers. So how do I know that container A and container B should be able to talk on a specific port? How do I control the specific relationships between these containers? And how do I control where that container is allowed to be deployed? How do I know which environments? Should this container be able to be deployed in production? Or should it just be able to be deployed into a development environment? So, uh, yeah. Go on. So there, there's some limitations to the security they offer today. They are actually releasing a plug-in system called AuthZ and AuthN to start trying to build out an ecosystem to solve some of these problems. But these are things we've been tackling for multiple years now and trying to provide that today for our enterprise customers. So how do you guys help you know, fill this out so you know, the, the customer can get the full benefits here of, of this uh, you know, you know, uh, of container technologies overall, not not just including Docker. So uh, today we have a policy grammar that basically describes every single aspect okay. of our system. Okay, so this comes back to the policy grammar. Yeah, so policy and security. We also have binary aware, uh, what we call semantic pro uh, pipelines that can actually hook into your database um, and we basically proxy the database through our semantic pipelines. We pair them one-to-one -one with our job instances so that we can guarantee high throughput. But it allows you to put additional hooks onto database queries that don't actually go to the database directly. So for instance, say that I have an audit log in my database and I want to make sure that deletes are not allowed on that audit log. We can actually enforce that on the wire before your database ever sees that traffic. We can control and make sure that drop requests for your production database will never actually make it to your database server, alleviating some of the security concerns around possibly misconfigured grant tables and making it easier on your DBA. So tell me, uh, uh, let's let's back up here because I'd like to go through that uh, uh, what you just what you just discussed here. Let's start with uh, the the policy grammar. What is your definition of a policy grammar and help us understand what it does exactly? So the way I look at it is there's four main tenets that to what a policy system needs to do. First, it needs to be able to control resource allocation. How much RAM, disk, CPU, network a job is allowed to consume dependent on the environment that it is being deployed to. Second is scheduling policy. Where should this workload run? Should it run in this cloud or that cloud dependent on my environment? Next is around network controls. Um, you want to be able to make sure that network links, ingress and egress to your jobs can be controlled in a very, very granular manner. And then the last is your authorization policy. Who should be able to access those workloads? Who should be able to deploy them? Now those are the four main things that I focus on. But in the Docker ecosystem, we also control what registries they can access, what namespaces on those registries they're allowed to access, exactly what images they're allowed to access, and you can actually control uh, different registries depending on your different environments. So say that you want to allow your developers to access a public registry. That's great. They can play, they can build new tools, they can do all, have all the flexibility they have today. However, in production, you probably don't want that to happen. Maybe you want that to come from a controlled repository owned by your organization. And we can actually do those splits and guarantee that kind of semantics. So grammar is at the heart of language, right? Yes. And, and then is at the heart of how you describe uh, using language, mm -hmm. right? And so, and descriptions and language relate to semantics, yes. right? And so if we're going to think this through as a policy grammar, what is the... Uh, what is the way that you're describing the, the data pipeline to allow those semantics? Absolutely. So that's a great question. So our grammar is uh, very similar to people that are used to like a curly brace notation when they're programming. We have a resource type like a job or a package or a route and then that's attached to a namespace. It's very similar to a Unix path where you may have slash production, slash staging. In a multi-tenant environment, you may have slash company A, slash production, slash company B, slash production. And then inside of that, you know, uh, that description, it has rules like, hey, if 
I am a job that is going to the production namespace, I want to add this scheduling tag and enforce that to guarantee that that goes to, say, AWS or some specific environment. So it's, it is a very simple grammar to read. You can go in and edit that policy. Policy actually controls who has access to policy, so it's turtles all the way down. And uh, it allows for you to really describe all of the fundamental rules your business has around how these applications, services, and other items should be deployed. Why is the Go programming language so critical to this? So we bet on Go very early. Uh, before Go really started getting traction in the for cloud and network applications, which I really still think is the pr primary use case for Go, um, Derek made a bet that Go was going to kind of revolutionize that, that space. And that was for a number of reasons. So first, the concurrency primitives in Go really make it easy for us to write highly scalable systems, and the performance is, is very good. We're very happy with the performance in, in Go. It's easy to program. It has clear conventions. It's easy to learn. The build chain is extremely fast. So when I'm going and building new releases, it is extremely, uh, extremely quick for me to test and build releases. It has cross-platform support, so I can cross-compile my Go applications between Mac builds, Windows builds, and Linux builds. And then they have an A-plus team behind the Go language at Google. We knew the support was going to be good going forward, and uh, we're a really big fan of the team. So, so now we're you know getting into the kind of the aspects of the semantic uh, pipeline and uh, how you describe it, right? So how does that? I guess in that helps me understand a little bit then how then you can then design the rest of the system, doesn't it? Because then then you know how the webhook should 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 be should be working, right? And how the database should be interacting. Isn't that correct? Yes, but uh, what we try to do is we try to inject what we call transparent security and transparent policy. So for your developer, they don't need to know that these semantic pipelines are even there. Right. You use your normal database drivers, your normal right. connection strings. We uh, let you know about those database credentials, very similar to how you would do that within a Docker ecosystem via MVARs. Right. The only difference is, is that the actual credentials you see actually don't exist on your database. They only exist within the context of that semantic pipeline that you're connecting to. The semantic pipeline understands the real credentials to your database. So your devs never get real creds. They get what we call ephemeral credentials that are only good for that one network route for that lifetime of that one job instance. And even if you were to broadcast those database credentials on Twitter, and it was a publicly open database to the world, they still wouldn't be able to connect. And then we can put additional value adds inside of that semantic pipeline, but the developer doesn't actually need to know that they're there. So they just connect to a production database, and your DBA can say, yeah, I want to control these specific actions. And only when they try to do an action that the security team really doesn't want them to do would they ever see the policy enforcement in action. Otherwise, it's just completely transparent to them, and things work as they would expect them to. They don't need to know. Yes. Right. And so, why does then the policy relate so importantly to the standardization efforts that you're really involved in, such as OCI. So basically, the policy we are actually have an initiative at AppSera to be uh, we're putting together a reference spec for our policy grammar, and we're trying to get a a lot more documentation about how that can happen. We find that a lot of other vendors are talking about policy now. If you would have looked at it two years ago, a lot of people didn't realize that they needed the policy hooks that we were working on. We've had those companies coming back to us and say, hey, we rolled out all these tools, but now that we realize we need more policy. And it's like, well, we said that years ago. We realize that you're there now. So how do we provide the expertise we've had in developing our policy grammar to the greater ecosystem? How can we apply that to tools like Docker or CoreOS or Kubernetes? And we're looking at how we can leverage the community, how we can get that out there for them as well. And that's something that we're planning and kind of working on internally at AppSera today. Oh, so a reference spec about the policy grammar itself, so you can define the grammar and people that can, can, can learn and implement the grammar by looking at the spec itself. Exactly, exactly. And then we can have a single way of describing these types of systems that is a little bit more portable across different container runtimes. Now that being said, when you tack on a policy system, what ends up usually happening is what we call a call-out policy system. 
you have a policy server, it has some hooks on it, you have components that ask the policy server something, and then the policy server responds with some kind of response. Well, we think there's some limitations to that design. What happens when you have a net split with your policy? What happens when you can't reach that policy server? What happens when there's so much activity because of a large scale cluster that that policy server is getting too much traffic and being asked too many questions? Well, how do you deal with those types of situations with policy? Inside of our product, we actually evaluate policy locally between our different uh, components. So we have a uh, policy that gets passed around to the different components and even in the event of a net split or some other network disconnect where the policy, uh, the, the API or auth servers are not reachable, those actual components can still do local evaluation as they've cached that policy and we make sure that as new policy versions are created that we cascade that to the, to the components and avoid a call out system like that. Hmm. So, so now we're starting to see really the, the relevance of policy, aren't we? It's taken some time for people to understand the relevance of policy. This is very true. And so, you know, what is it now that you're needing to do to help people really understand how to automate that policy? So th that is a great question because a policy is a complex topic. Any security person that you talk to right now today, policy is even more complex as you have individual security solutions bolted on to many different pieces that have been bolted together to create one working system. So you may be using four or five or ten different pieces of software to create your internal PaaS if you're rolling it out yourself. You may be rolling out your own scheduler with something like Kubernetes or Mesosphere. You have a Docker runtime. You have uh, some kind of uh, you know, uh, time-based cron scheduler like a marathon. Or you have all of these different tools. And they all have slightly different ways of trying to tack security into different parts. We find that this is actually extremely difficult. So when you try to consolidate that all into one grammar that controls all these resources, yes, there's complexities there. So we've been working on ways that you can template out policy, new UI constraints to make it easier to configure policy, and we've been working with some of our customers to get feedback about best ways to describe policy as it relates to your LDAP in in infrastructure, your LDAP groups, and how you bring in those user records, how you describe this for an organization that may have thousands of applications deployed across thousands of machines. and. Um, Yes, that's, a, that's something we're always looking to optimize. So, when you're looking to optimize that, you know, and I think about semantic, the semantics of technologies, a lot of it comes down to the metadata itself. Absolutely. And understanding, and so you really need a real, you really need that rich metadata and the capabilities to understand the data to turn it into that real organic material that, you know, leads to you know, strong automated systems. Otherwise, the automation just can go haywire. Absolutely. So th there's a reason that we look at package management very seriously. We rolled out our own package manager so that we could describe the metadata about what was running in the system in a way that we thought was a little clearer than how Docker described it in their image formats. So if you look at a Docker image, you'll see multiple layers and they aren't described with very uh, readable metadata. You see j large, you know, SHA-like strings that describe those image layers. So if you ask someone, oh, well, in this Docker image, what software is in there? Well, it's, it's not very clear to the user what's actually there. So when we stage our applications um, outside of the Docker context, it detects the frameworks and actually calls into our package manager, which uses a tag-based system to describe dependencies. So I may deploy a node app, and it's going to go and look for a package tagged node. And it will be very clear what version of node that package is picking up. And then that node package has its own dependencies, things like Git or Python for some of the build chain, as well as an OS dependency that it's going to need to pull in. And each of these packages can be audited by your security team, make sure that there's high quality metadata across them. So when you go to audit software inside of an AppSera platform, you can actually say, oh, can you tell me every single workload that's using this exact release of Java? And I can tell you exactly what's running in your infrastructure, exactly what needs to be updated. We offer policy hooks around package retirement 
and we can also make sure that say that you r release a new version of a Ruby package you can say yeah Ruby now is defined as this new Ruby package and when you go to restage your Ruby applications that'll automatically get picked up dependency updates can happen automatically and we get a lot better auditability about every single action in the system as we provide audit logs on everything so if I want to know, you know, who updated this package, who uploaded a new package, who's consuming this package, we have all of that metadata available for our customers. Okay. And so with that made metadata available, that again makes it increasingly transparent for the developer. Absolutely. It? And the developer spends less time thinking about what dependencies he needs. So there's always the case where a de uh, developer will need a newer dependency than what is in the system. We facilitate that in their sandboxes to allow them to post the dependencies that they want to play with. But say that they don't need a new dependency. They're writing another, you know, node app. They know that, you know, they want to use the same node runtime they've been using. They want to use the same OS they've been using. And they don't really care about the exact version. They just need a working version. Well, your security team can post the packages that need to be used. And when they go to deploy their, uh, their application, they just worry about their application source code. And we'll go ahead and pull all those packages for them. And all of a sudden, they didn't even need to think about dependencies. They didn't have to think about installing dependencies, how those dependencies might break, and everything just works transparently out of the box for them. Is that the beauty then of containers in this context then? So not all containers provide that. The reason that we are able to provide that is because we can control the packages in, in our policy grammar. We can update what those package definitions mean, and that's a completely seamless experience for them. So it's really around how you describe the different layer formats that you have, the different um, layers of your file system. So, you know, Docker, they use these, you know, longer SHA looking layers, which are a little harder to inspect. And that metadata is really, really important for your auditability concerns. And so we, when we designed our package manager, we tried to uh, use it as kind of an idea as meta packages. So don't relate it to something like Yum or Apt or some of those tools where you may have to install 10, 15 packages just to get a working runtime. Uh, you would get one package that kind of describes, you know, I need Python. And when I install Python, yeah, I'm going to get virtual env and pip and some common Python libraries. And they're kind of meta packages that make it a little easier for you to kind of describe your infrastructure. So when you look at the layers inside of a job in the AppSera platform, the average is about five layers where you'll have an OS layer, a couple of libraries, and a runtime in your application. It's not a dependency tree that is overwhelming. It makes it very easy for you to create new packages. Our package build system is very, very um, familiar to people used to you know, make, make, install. Effectively, it's some metadata, some checksums to make sure that you're grabbing the correct uh, versions of that software. We have a verification MD file for all the package scripts that we include to guarantee they were signed by the correct parties, that we know that they were not tampered with when we got those packages for you. And we can have a guarantee that they are exactly the packages that you're expecting. So we take a lot of time to make sure that what we deliver to you is signed and secured when possible. We make sure that there are SHAs for every package to make sure that they haven't been manipulated. We have a back plane based on NATS that uses signed JWT tokens to prevent forgeries throughout the system. So there's no way to send a fake message to do something in the AppTera platform. And there's unique keys across all of our components for every cluster. And we make sure that that uh, control plane is heavily secured to guarantee that any message that a component gets all the way up to our Nginx routing tier is uh, known to be from us and signed to be part of your cluster. We actually worked with the Nginx team, um, you know, several years ago, wrote a module for Nginx that allowed for dynamic routing before Nginx actually implemented that in their pro versions that are available today. But even now in their pro version, it supports for, uh, having customizable routes and dynamic routes but it's not through a secure and signed token. So while they offer that functionality, we still have better security primitives around that in our implementation. So Josh, you know, you know, in conclusion, you know, perhaps you could tell us about this community edition that that you guys have developed. So we just released community edition a few weeks ago and basically as we normally service enterprises, we wanted to get our technology in the hands of more people. We wanted more devs to be able to play with the platform and realize the offering that we have today. So we released a completely free edition. Um, you can go to our website and download that. 
and it has a com very complete feature set. In fact, all of our persistent uh, data storage, all of our networking drivers, as well as all of our automatic framework staging and um, is all included in the product. The limitations are minor as there are certain limitations for the enterprise context. It doesn't have hybrid enablement as that requires some custom setup for VPNs and complex network topologies. It uh, is currently not supporting an HA mode on our uh, control plane, but that control plane can be backed up and is very reliable on a single VM. And then the last piece is really around the enterprise level support, maintenance, and um, you know special services that we provide around our product. So you're limited to a community forum where we're happy to address issues and talk about that. It currently deploys to AWS, your local v, um, your VMware products like Workstation and Fusion. It supports VirtualBox, and we're going to be releasing vSphere and OpenStack drivers by the end of, by about mid -de December. And we really want this to be a full-fledged solution. It has unlimited uh, computational power as the number of instance managers, our equivalent of a Docker D, are uh, not limited in that product. So if you want to bring up a 50-node cluster with tons of compute power, that's completely possible within our community edition. It includes full documentation, and we really encourage people to give it a try. That's great. I, I, we'd love to learn more about that, actually, and write about it in addition. Yeah, so. So thank you very much for taking the time, Josh, and uh, we'll have to learn more about that later. Sounds great. Thank Thanks. you very much for, uh, for having me. Thank you.